The worst thing you can do as a writer, if you write like to write comedy, is to keep anything in that the audience knows and you know is asking for a laugh and doesn't get it. If it doesn't get the laugh, and, and it clearly is a line that was meant to get a laugh, and it doesn't get the laugh, get it out of there. Those are words of wisdom from playwright Ken Ludwig, whose play, Dear Jack, Dear Louise, recently had its world premiere at Arena Stage. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Ken Ludwig has been called the reigning king of theatrical farce. He burst onto Broadway with Lend Me a Tenor, which won two Tony Awards, and followed that with Crazy For You, which also won a Tony Award for Best Musical. Hit followed hit, and they include Moon Over Buffalo, 20th Century, Be My Baby, Leading Ladies, and so on and so on. And the awards continued as well, Olivier's, a Helen Hayes, and so on and so on. Ken Ludwig also turned his hand to writing mysteries for the stage, adapting Murder on the Orient Express and Baskerville, and creating The Games Afoot, which won an Edgar Award. But Ken Ludwig's play, Dear Jack, Dear Louise, mines new ground yet again. It's a two-character play, and it's based on his parents' correspondence and subsequent meeting during World War II. It's a straightforward story about two very different people who get to know each other and fall in love through their letters to one another. My father was a doctor. He had just graduated medical school, and he was drafted. And he lived in Pennsylvania, but he was sent to the West Coast to a little town of Medford, Oregon. He started helping the incoming wounded from the Pacific Theater. He was in a hospital there. Uh, my mother, meanwhile, was in Brooklyn, New York, where she had graduated high school, had started college, but decided to leave college and wanted to become a showgirl. So she was living in a uh, one of those Broadway boarding houses with other Broadway hopefuls, taking tap dancing and singing lessons. And they couldn't have been more different from what, as, as that sounds. He was shy. She was outgoing. And their fathers knew each other and said, oh, you should meet. I'm going to give you his address. I'm going to give you her address. So they start, started writing letters, and that's how they got to know each other, and that's the basis of the whole play. How much of those letters of your parents did you actually use in the construction of the play when you wrote it? Well, here's the thing. I didn't have the letters. I knew that the letters existed. Family lore, my mother had told me that. My father predeceased my mother. Uh, my mother still kept the letters. And then towards the very end of her life, she died eight years after my dad, told me that she had destroyed the letters. And she never told me why specifically, but looking back on it, my brother and I think that she must have felt there was an intimacy about them that she really didn't want her boys to see. Now, whether they were actually very intimate in terms of any shocking way, I sort of doubt, but I think in her mind they were enough that she thought, no, she didn't want us to see them. So I knew they existed, so in writing the play, I wrote from scratch. I have enormous respect, I would like to say, for anyone who opts for privacy. That's, I really, really That's what do. it was. That's what it was. In doing research for the play, there were lots and lots of correspondence out there. At the play itself, people come up to me and say, oh, you know, I have my, my parents' letters or my grandparents' letters, and we love this and this evoked that. And some of these sets of correspondence have been published over the years, so I was able to get a hold of those, and that really gave me some real facts and figures about this exact time and where doctors would be stationed abroad and things like that. Mm -hmm. And how close to their actual story is Dear Jack, Dear Louise? It's very close. I talk about in the, in, the, in the play, for example, that my father's mother was one of 12 sisters, and that was true. Uh, I, what I don't mention in, in the play is that there was actually a brother also. <laughs> it didn't work out in describing the stories as well. Uh, but there was a brother. Can you imagine being the one brother and having 12 sisters? No. Amazing. It's all true. Uh, my dad grew up in a little town of Coatesville, Pennsylvania, which was a steel town. He put himself through college by working in the steel mills. And my mother grew up in Brooklyn. That was all true. She wanted to be in the theater. She, 
She was there with other hopefuls, a fellow named Van Johnson. Well, he became a huge international movie star. And and, uh, Oscar Levant, who became famous. He was in a lot of Gene Kelly movies and things. And so all of that is true, that they met by letter, that they wrote the letters. And then I had tried to just make sure that the story had shape and form, as I think all plays need. Certainly the kinds of plays that I write a real beginning and a middle and an end. Can you tell me about your thinking as you created it? Had you always imagined it as a two-hander? No. Actually, when I first thought about writing it, I thought, well, it might be interesting to set this in the Army base in Medford, Oregon, and then I'd need to do some extra research about what it was like living in an Army base. And then it would have looked a lot, I think, like a lot of my other plays. Most of my plays, not most, but some are one-set, eight-character comedies. Uh, Lend Me a Tenor, Move Over, Moon Over Buffalo, Leading Ladies, uh, Games of Foot. Those, those all, for some reason, eight seems to be the sweet spot for me. Then I've written a different kind of play, more like Baskerville. that has fa- five characters playing, people playing lots of roles. But I've never tried anything with just two actors on stage. Watching it the other night, it occurred to me, they, of course, have long stretches where each of them speaks without interruption because these are letters. And I was thinking about a a play that I admire a lot that's gotten a lot of wonderful uh, publicity over the years called The Weir that was done at the National Theater in London. That's a monologue. And I thought, uh, when I first read it, I thought, how can you sustain a monologue really for the life of a play and make it dramatic? As I've studied playwriting over the years, the one thing I've always thought is, you know, two characters for purposes of conflict is really a play. Otherwise, a monologue doesn't function as a play. But I was wrong. And I found out in writing this that as long as you can sustain a level of story, that the story makes it a play. Well, this was the world premiere, and this is the process I really want you to walk me through. So how many readings had you had before it was mounted on a stage? I had three. I did the first one in my living room. I invited two actors I knew in the community. I invited a few friends, and we sat around. There were six people who listened, simply because I wanted to hear it out loud. I don't usually do that with plays, and I may do that with the next play. It was really fun, uh, usually because my plays have more characters and and, uh, people are walking in this entrance and out another exit. So we did that one. And the script didn't change very much uh, from reading to reading. The second one, I've been on the board of trustees of the Folger Shakespeare Library for 10 years, and all my friends there are, uh, know all about my work. And so I talked to the head of the theater. and said, hey, how about giving me the theater for a day? So I hired two actors and, and did it at the Folger one night. With The place was packed with 250 people, and I really got a sense of what worked I picked the sound effects. Uh, I had a a, a production manager. And then the next time, the third time of all things, is Theater J here in town in Washington uh, said, would I direct a reading for a benefit for for their theater? Uh, And I directed that about eight months ago. And then we did the production. Okay. On one hand, I mean, you are the consummate theater pro. Anybody in the theater would love your resume. Thank you. This is also something that's really, really close to you. It's about your family. Was that kind of challenging for you to be able to maintain a critical distance sometimes? Did you have to talk yourself down? As we all know when you're writing, you know, as we say, killing puppies is something that has to happen. (laughs) Well, you know, it's funny you say that. There there were no puppies to kill in this case. No, it really flowed, and it surprised me. It certainly – I wrote it more quickly than I've ever written a play before because it seemed to be – I don't want to say I was channeling them, but I was sitting down. I always write longhand, and I was writing letters, and I thought I'm just going to write letters to each other. And this play sort of wrote itself, I guess, because I knew the characters so well. When you saw the play, not as a reading, but mounted as a play, did you have to sort of jiggle here and there and and fix things, or again, was it basically just (laughs) like Athena from the head of Zeus? Now, there we really went through a process, and the process was really fun and interesting. When I directed the readings, I put the two actors behind two desks, and they literally read the letters. They read their own letters. So Louise, my mom, was reading her letter, and then Jack would read his letter. 
the important thing in the play is that they don't look at each other. These are letters. It's the person in their mind, so they're looking out. That I understood that from the get-go. There's always tendency by all the actors who have done it to want to look at each other. I said, no, no, no. So uh, I was directing it, and they sat at the desks. And, of course, these were, re- these were readings where I only had the actors for about three or four hours before we put the show on that night. So we didn't have time to try to do anything. When we got into the rehearsal hall, Jackie Maxwell directed the play, and she's done just a magnificent job directing it, and she's a magnificent person, and she's a wonderful director. And from the get-go, she had the thought of, wait a second, we don't want to trap them behind desks the whole time. We're in the Krieger. It's a big theater. We have a fantastic set by Beowulf Borat, and we said, well, we have two desks, but let's get them up and get them moving. They should memorize the text. And as they, maybe she pulls a little dressing gown on when she's on tour, he uh, will pick up something from his bookshelf, a a newspaper, and read Eleanor Roosevelt's latest column. You know, get them moving, never again looking at each other, not interacting physically per se, but make it more of a kind of a ballet of their movements as they tell these letters, as they, in a sense, read these letters. And it worked out beautifully. She just did a great job. So that it, it feels more like a play with movement. You wouldn't think to yourself, oh, yeah, they read those letters because they didn't. They're memorized, and, and they acted them. When did you first know you wanted to be involved in theater? When I was six years old, <laughs> without a doubt. Uh, my folks t- took my brother and I to a play in New York City because my mother's folks lived in Brooklyn. And every year we'd go up around the holidays, and we'd see a show for years. And within, oh, three or four years, I thought, this is it. That's all I want to do. I just want to be in the theater. And your mom, I'm assuming, stayed active in the theater. I mean, if not on Broadway. She stayed active in theater, all right. My dad practice took him to York, Pennsylvania, where I was born and raised. And they have a wonderful community theater there called York Little Theater. Now it's called the Belmont Theater. And she was part of it, and she would be in shows. And my brother and I would sit in the audience and watch her. So she was able to fulfill her love for theater by being in community theater. Which is fabulous, fabulous. of course. Yeah. What about playwriting? What was it about playwriting that made you say, aha? Well, as a kid, when I was in high school, I was in all of the shows. I was an actor because we all think, I think, at that age, in order to fulfill ourselves in the theater, we want to be in the theater, oh, I'll be an actor. At least there's a moment of that. There certainly was for me. So I was in the shows. I played Henry Higgins in My Fair Lady, I'll have you know. And and it was said that I was the greatest Henry Higgins since Rex Harrison. It, it was, <laughs> I won't ask who no, said it. It was said by my mother, <laughs> but it was said. And then I got into college and I directed, um, directed She's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and a few other things. And then I, I all the while knowing that by that, that time that I wanted to write. Why? Well, I've always been a sort of kind of somebody who lives in my own head probably too much. And I loved reading plays. I mean, I've read thousands of plays. That's what I do. And, uh, and I love it. I love the history of theater. I've written a book about Shakespeare. I'm a big Shakespeare yes, geek. That's How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare. And that is a great book. Oh, thank you. I gave it to my godchild for his kid. Oh, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Oh, thanks a lot. And I loved writing it because I taught my – it's called How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare. And it's about teaching my children how to recite Shakespeare. Because that's how you learn, really learn Shakespeare, is if you memorize passages. And I love that, and I just live that stuff every day. It's an odd little niche. I don't know. Everybody has their own niche, and that's my niche, and it's what I love. Were your parents supportive of, of this move to theater? They were very much so with this caveat that when I got out of uh, high school and then went to college, I went to college, and then after, at the, towards the end of college, they said, well, now what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to be a the- in the theater the rest of my life. I'm going to be a playwright. And they said, well, that's very interesting. We're all, all for that. How wonderful. But what are you really going to do? Because you've got to earn a living. So they convinced me to apply to graduate schools. I did and went all the while knowing all I really wanted to do was be a writer in the theater. Okay. Your plays are typically funny. Even Dear Jack, Dear Louise, it has some very funny moments in it. Writing comedy, this is not for the faint-hearted. What drew you to comedy? Comedy is hard. Comedy is hard. I think it was Edmund Keene said, dying is easy, comedy is hard. This was on his deathbed. I've often asked myself that, and, and my friends will say, I hate this question. They'll say, well, are you going to write something serious? And I say, well, no, no, 
You don't get it. Comedy is very serious. It's just as serious. We should be doing more comedies. We should be doing comedies. When people teach Shakespeare, they'll typically teach the four big tragedies in high school. And I say to teachers all the time, no, 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 no. You should also be teaching Twelfth Night and Much Ado About Nothing and Midsummer Night's Dream because they're just as great and they have a different view of life that you have to, kids have to understand as well. So I think I'd, I've always done comedy ultimately because I'm optimistic. I really do believe in my heart. It's sort of a, it's an optimism. I don't think it's a Pollyanna-ish kind of optimism. I think it's a realistic kind of optimism. It's, that's how I look at life. I do look at life that if we band together as communities and as friends with an open mind, we can push the ball forward. We can push it a little bit. Even if it's one one hundredth of an inch, you can make a contribution in that direction. And that's what I live for. Comedy is really hard. I mean, <laughs> I don't mean to get, but I'm always in awe of people who write it, people who act it. And, you know, you get an instantaneous response. Something is going to land or it doesn't. There's no in between anywhere. Happening. No, there isn't. And it, and a good rule is if, if you're in the middle of a show and there is a tendency to say when a line doesn't land and you think it should and you get your first audience because the first audience tells you everything. You don't know until you have that first preview audience there. And then if a line you think was going to be terrific doesn't land, the tendency as a writer is to say, wait a second, that was the actor's fault. And then you go to the director. And then you say, let's take a beat before that. And, a, and finally, you got to go, no, it's the line. <laughs> it was my mistake. And you just got to take out. The worst thing you can do as a writer, if you write, like to write comedy, is to keep anything in that the audience knows and you know is asking for a laugh and doesn't get it. If it doesn't get the laugh, and, and it clearly is a line that was meant to get a laugh, and it doesn't get the laugh, get it out of there. Because it's so painful. As an audience person, oh, it hurts. It really hurts it does. when that happens. Absolutely. Your comedy is, it seems to me to come out of character as opposed to a punchline. Thank you. I hope so. Yeah. And and you're also really good at physical comedy, mm -hmm. like Lend Me a Tenor. There's right. movement on stage and... So there's a physical aspect of comedy that you also write that, you know, also comes out of character. I just wonder, I mean, really, I wonder how you do that, but I realize that's just not a good question to ask. But so if you had advice for somebody who wanted to write comedy for theater, mm -hmm. what would you say to them? Well, the answer is that you read and read and read. When kids come to me and their parents come or I'm doing graduation speeches this or that, People say, I want to be a writer. The answer is read, 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 read. And, of course, you're lucky if you don't want to be in the theater. You also can go, go, go and go see plays. But you really learn from the people who came before you. It's the old Newton standing on the shoulders of the geniuses who came before. You have to learn how Shakespeare did it, the god. But you also have to learn how Goldsmith wrote She Stoops to Conquer, probably the greatest comedy after Shakespeare. You have to understand how Sheridan, Richard Brinsley Sheridan, did it, contemporary of Goldsmith, in about 1775 and 6, uh, with the Rivals and the School for Scandal. I'm just jumping around. Arthur Wing, Sir Arthur Wing Panero, the first uh, a dramatist who was ever knighted, who wrote a series of great far farces in his day. And then you got to jump right up to Wilde and Coward and Kaufman and Hart. And if you don't understand those comedies, if you don't have them in your bones, if you don't really know how they were written, you can't write great comedy for the stage. You just can't. Lend Me a Tenor was your first Broadway play. Right. Can you walk me through that? How long had you been writing it? How was it produced? I mean, the first time on Broadway, that's huge. It was huge, and lucky, lucky me. What happened was, wanted to be a playwright. I was writing in the mornings. I had a day job, and I would write every morning for four hours, and I had my first, second, third play. They were done in church basements with 20, 30 people. And then uh, I was at a party in New York and met somebody who said he's a director in, in London. He'd heard I was a playwright, and would I give him a copy of my latest play? So I did. His name was David Gilmore. He took it back with him to London. He called me three days later and said, I want to direct this play. I really like it. It was Lend Me a Tenor, I, and I want to show it to a producer friend of mine. And I acted like a complete jackass, as you do when you're young. I still do, but I 
did especially then. <laughs> and and I said, well, you know, I know a lot of producers too. I'm I'm not a, such a nobody as you think I am. I know a lot of producers. Who's your friend? And he said, Andrew Lloyd Webber. And his friend producer was Andrew Lloyd Webber. And Andrew Lloyd Webber called me three days later and said, I want to produce your play in the West End. And lo and behold, he got me on a plane three weeks later. I arrived in Heathrow Airport. His chauffeur picked me up. I met him at the American Bar at the Savoy. And off we went. And and not, and not six months later, he had it on in the West End at the uh, what is now the Gilgood Theater. It was called The Globe on Shaftesbury Avenue. It was a big hit. We got Olivier Awards. We got this and that and the other thing. And I got to know Andrew very well because I lived over there with all these people for the six months of getting the show ready. And then Andrew produced it on Broadway. So first it was the West End, and then it was on Broadway. And we got lots of awards, and it played, and it was a big hit. So suddenly I went from having, you know, really paid my dues and spent time in the vineyards, working in the vineyards, toiling away, learning my craft, learning about the theater for those three or four years first, and then had this break where Andrew Lloyd Webber started producing my plays. So then the next thing that happened was I got a call. I had Lend Me a Tenor running on Broadway, and I got a call out of the blue from somebody named Roger Horchow, who was a wealthy American businessman who had acquired the rights to the songs of George and Ira Gershwin and said, would I write a uh, musical using those songs as the songs in the, in the musical? And at first I said, no, because I don't know how to write musicals. Dumb me. I did it again. But then I said, yes. And uh, I wrote Crazy for You. And Crazy for You was on Broadway for five years at the Schubert Theater, and we won the Tony Award as Best Musical, and then it went to London, won the Olivier there. So with those two under my belt, I was on my way. I didn't need a day job anymore, and, and I, I was able to not, yes. <laughs> and I was able to, to, to make a career in the theater. I remember with Crazy for You, Frank Rich in the New York Times wrote such a glowing review. It felt like an insult if you did not go and see that play, like you were somehow insulting Frank Rich. Oh, my God, that review. Oh, it was amazing. You, well, of course, it I'm sure amazing. you remember. It's framed on my wall. <laughs> yeah, I bet. What a review. So how did you have to adjust your writing with so many songs? I mean, that's a play packed with songs. It is packed with songs. And I think there's one too many songs. And I've always felt that the second act had one too many songs. But in order to tell the story, I kind of needed it. Yeah. And the director and I talked a lot about it. It was very different. And, and I was sincere when uh, Roger... Horschel called me and said, I want you to write a musical. I was very sincere in saying, I don't think I know how to write a musical. I don't know the form as well as I know plays. Sure, I know lots of musicals and I've seen them. But, but it's a different animal. It's a different animal. And, it, and it's an animal where the songs have to tell the story. And when you do a jukebox musical, we were one of the first, if not maybe the first jukebox musical, jukebox musical, meaning that a trunk musical where the songs already existed by a great masters of song. What I did is I went out to stores. In those days, there were CDs. Tower Records existed. And I went out and got every CD I could possibly find that had the songs of George and Ira Gershwin. So I had a stack of about 20 CDs or 30 CDs, and I'd play them and play them and play them. I'd try to pick songs that would advance the story that I had sort of sketched a general story about a banker who wants to be in show business and uh, his mother, who's in the banking business, wants him to foreclose on a little theater in Dead Rock, Nevada. And that's where he meets a wonderful woman who, whose father owns that theater that's about to go under. So I had to think of what songs would advance that story. I can't be bothered now, seem to tell the story of uh, a banker who can't be bothered with banking. He wants to be in show business himself. Someone to watch over me. She's the only gal in this town, and she has nobody she can rely on. Her father dotes on her, but the town's full of people who don't understand her. So one after another, I started putting songs in place that would tell the story. And, and of course, the book scenes in a musical can't be very long. They have to be short. They have to just get you into the next song as quickly as possible. Tell the story, and if it's a comedy, as this was, land a good joke and get on with the story. And it, it is a different art form. So it was sort of patchwork putting it all together. Wow, interesting though. So much of your work is based in or around theater. 
obviously you do love theater, but what is it about theater that's so ripe as a, a place where you can place your plays? That's a great question, and I, I, I've i tried to think it through, and I think there's a couple reasons. Theater, by its nature, is a metaphor for the whole world. Greatest cliche in the whole world. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. But there's a reason that he says that in As You Like It. The reason is, is because theater is a metaphor for the bigger world, and, and it certainly functions for Shakespeare all the time that way. He has lots of little bits of theater running through the plays. You know, in Hamlet, there's a play that's the hinge of the whole everything. Second of all, I think it's because as I was growing up in York, Pennsylvania, little York in the Amish country, that's the real, York and Lancaster are the real Dutch country, we call them the Amish country of Pennsylvania. You know, there wasn't much theater. It, it was a quiet community. Uh, it's a farming community. And I think as I grew up, I thought that the theater was this great, unknowable, unknown world that I didn't have access to. And so I idealized it. And as I idealized it and romanticized it in my own mind, I thought, that, well, of course I'll write about the theater because people have pointed out to me since, and I didn't know it when I was writing it. And Lend Me a Tenor, Lend Me a Tenor is about a fellow named Max who is an assistant to the producer of an opera, of the opera, of the Cleveland Grand Opera Company. All my comedies are set in small towns. Cleveland was a small t is a small town, has some great institutions, but it's a small town. So being in a small town and Max wants to be an opera singer, he wants to get out of the business world and become an opera singer. At the time, my day job was as a lawyer and I wanted to be in the great world of the theater. So Max was me. I didn't realize that till 20 years later, and people started to point it out to me. And in a way, Bobby in, in Crazy for You is, is much the same story. He's a banker who wants to be in show business. Right. So that was why show business was always the thing I wanted to write about. Well, you've turned your eye also on Sherlock Holmes with Baskerville and the games afoot, which mm -hmm. is, again, back to theater. I'm setting it on the actor... William Gillette, Thank you. who played uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes for 30 years. Yeah, and he becomes the main character of the games afoot. Right, and he becomes, could have become Sherlock Holmes. And my latest play, which opens next season, is called Moriarty, which is another play in the same tradition of Baskerville, which is having five actors on stage, a Holmes, a Watson, and then three actors who play 40 parts. And I, I've sort of fallen in love with the Sherlock Holmes stories. I was between plays, didn't know what to do, picked A Hound of the Baskervilles off the shelf, reread it, and went, this is a great piece of literature. It's really, I think, one of the two great adventure stories ever written in the English language. The, uh, I think Treasure Island. And, and I thought, oh, this would be fun to dramatize this in some way. But it's a big story. How can I dramatize it? So I thought by making it as few actors as I can, because mm -hmm. that made it interesting. It made it, it made it a play about the theater as opposed to just a play about Sherlock Holmes. Exactly. And it, was that fun, using those five actors to create 40? Obviously, you had to write them differently. Lots like... of fun. It was really fun. It was a, an adventure to write it. I felt the same way with Moriarty. It made, yes, I have to think about and, and I have to think quite specifically about the doubling and the tripling, you know, because who went out one door, how can you come in in a different costume and another? Not just to get laughs as a costume, to try to tell the story with integrity. What, I mean, what I tried to do in Baskerville, and I hopefully have done in Moriarty, different challenges, because Hound of the Baskerville is already written as a whole novel, whereas Moriarty, I had to take different stories and create my own mystery. The, the challenge in terms of stagecraft was the same, how to tell the story with as much integrity as I could muster, really get invested in the characters. The second one, Moriarty, uh, obviously has Moriarty in it, but also Irene Adler, when sh the one time in the canon of 56 stories that Sherlock Holmes loses his heart. And make it about romance and make it about love and make it about a conflict between duty and love and, and really concentrate there. And if it's funny doing that, great, but tell the story with integrity. You've directed also throughout the years. I have. How is it directing your own work? Well, I think it's more challenging because I don't have a second perspective. 
on it. So on the one hand, it's fun to direct. I love it. I love being in charge and rolling up my sleeves and saying, do this, do that. Who, who, hey, who wouldn't want a God mic in their hand yelling, do this, do that? But I do miss the extra perspective that a really smart director can bring me. So I don't do it too often. I do it now and then. But I wonder also what your stints or experiences, rather, as a director, how that added to your skill set as a playwright. Oh, I think a lot. A lot. I realized really some practicalities I needed. It, it gave me renewed respect for directors of how they put to get things together. And the idea of bringing to directing a genuine level of creativity that says, I'm bringing to the table not just pushing actors indoors and outdoors and putting a costume on them, but creating the world in a way that I think the playwright wants. So next year, Moriarty? Next year, Moriarty. We'll look forward to it. Ken, thank you so much for coming, and congratulations thank you on so Dear much. Jack, Dear Louise. Thanks a million. You're welcome. That's playwright Ken Ludwig. His play, Dear Jack, Dear Louise, had its world premiere at Arena Stage. You can keep up with Ken at kenludwig.com. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. You can subscribe to Artworks wherever you get your podcasts, and I hope you do. And then I hope you leave us a rating on Apple because it helps people to find us. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening. <laughs>